Now, when a lot of people see the title of my talk, when do nice guys finish first? For a lot of folks, their answer is, well, duh, never. Everybody knows nice guys finish last, right? And as an evolutionary psychologist who is turned on by evolution, uh, I find that this attitude maps onto many people's perceptions of how evolution by natural selection works. Now, here's some classic quotes from some various philosophers, biologists, uh, artists across the years. When Herbert Spencer coined the term survival of the, of the fittest for natural selection, it describes this uh, scenario where only the strong can survive and the weak are left to die, and that's the way things are. Philosopher Thomas Hobbes in his classic Leviathan described the natural state of mankind as a war of all against all, where life is nasty, brutish, and short. Poet Alfred Lord Tennyson uh, described nature red in tooth and claw, which evokes this image of predators ripping apart screaming prey or animals engaged in ruthless, bloody competition with each other uh, over access to territories and to mates. Now, is this actually how evolution works? Well, modern evolutionary biologists recognize that there is a lot of nasty competition in nature, but there is also a lot of cooperation and sometimes even outright altruism. Now many forms of cooperation are mutually beneficial. So for example, a pollinator like a wasp or a bee benefits from the pollen from the flowers and the flower benefits because it gets its pollen spread to other flowers. When a cleaner fish cleans and picks the parasites off a host fish, it gets a nice free easy meal and the host fish gets a good cleaning, good for both. Plants are engaged in many intricate mutualisms with the fungus uh, that are on their root, where the plant will provide carbon for the fungal mycorrhiza, and the fungus will provide phosphorus that the plant needs. Both benefit very much from this. So there's a lot of cooperation out there in, uh, in nature. In a lot of cases, this is a simple reciprocal exchange. So if one individual has the choice to help another, uh, if it decides that it wants to and it helps, then it changes the recipient's uh, incentive. So the recipient becomes more likely to return that help than if none were given. Now, this doesn't require any consciousness. This can occur biochemically in the, the plants and the, uh, uh, and the fungal mycorrhiza. In humans, this can involve genuine altruism. When I help you, it causes you to value my welfare more and to genuinely want to help me, which then causes me to value your welfare more and want to help you. So we're both you know, being very psychologically altruistic. You're doing something because we want the other person to benefit. But the reason we feel that way is because this is a mutually beneficial relationship for both of us. And then if there is a non cooperator over, over here who doesn't help anybody, then they end up worse off. And these two are in a much better position to compete against this type. Now in humans and many other species, uh, we can go even further, where we often help others who do not directly, you know, seem to, be, where we don't seem to directly benefit from it. I would argue that's what's going on in this case, is when you help somebody else, this contains some information, such that anybody who sees this act can infer something about you, something about your qualities that can then change how they interact with you. So we want to know, well, what information do people infer when they see somebody help somebody else? Well, a really obvious example is when we see huge philanthropists like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates who have given billions of dollars to charity. What can we infer about the fact that they have given billions of dollars to charity? Well, they have billions of dollars to spare. I don't imagine any of us in this room could you know, freely given away even mere millions. Uh, you know, the, the cost would be crippling uh, if we did so. But for somebody like Bill Gates, this is, you know, this, this is not even his lunch money. Uh, this is his like morning snack money. Um, so we can infer great wealth from this, and this philanthropy can be a signal of his wealth, much more so than say buying, you know, a second Lamborghini. 
Not that he has one, I actually don't know. Um, we can have other forms of, of generosity. If one person runs into a burning building to carry somebody else uh, out on their shoulder or dives into a river to save a baby, this confers, conveys information about their bravery, their courage, uh, their physical strength, all of which is useful to know about other individuals, to know who to pair with, you know, whom not to mess with. But in addition to just signaling things like wealth and abilities, we can also imagine generosity just signaling good character, which is beneficial. A great example of this is the biblical parable of the Good Samaritan, where one man is robbed and beaten and left for dead, and then others pass him by the road on the road without helping, until a Samaritan comes along, a member of the hated out group, sees this man, takes great pity on him, cares for him at great risk and great cost to himself in order to nurse this man back to health. Now, we can infer that the Samaritan cares a lot about other people, that he's willing to help, even a member you know, of you know, uh, an outgroup. And if he cares so much for people, this might be somebody who is worth pairing with, who is worth trusting, uh, but because he's less likely to cheat you. Now, of course, there's no guarantees in life, and sometimes people will try to appear nice in order to, to later cheat. But the safe money is that if you have to trust somebody, then this is a good candidate. And of course, this is an extreme example of many other things that we do all the time that signal our good character, our willing to help, whether it's volunteering, whether it's giving gifts to others, donating blood, looking after others. All of these can convey information about our good character, which can then change how others in react towards us. So we can ask, well, what happens to people who are seen to help? Here's some data from a, a study that we did where we had people play a cooperative group game where it was in the lab where it's costly to, to, to give money to a group, but everybody benefits from it. And we have here afterwards, people could trust money to others. And again, this is costly because there's a risk that the person will just keep your, keep your money, take the money and run. And what we see is that the, on the left here, the best cooperator in the group is entrusted with the most money, more so than the second best cooperator, and so on down the line. And the person who cooperates the least is entrusted the least. And there's money on the line here, so people are putting where their, their money where their mouth is. So there's benefits to being seen to cooperate. People also tend to choose better cooperators. So another experiment where people had the opportunity to give to an environmental charity, this, uh, the Sierra Club, uh, and then could be chosen for another economic transaction. What we found is that people tend, are overwhelmingly likely to trust whichever of these two folks had given the most to the charity. So there's a benefit to being seen, to being chosen, but also giving to that charity was actually a pretty good predictor of somebody's likelihood of helping there. Um, so using that as information was quite useful. Uh, so here we have the observer again choosing uh, between those two individuals. But what about romance? Does generosity actually turn people on? Now here in particular is where the popular notion is that nice guys finish last because everybody knows women prefer bad boys. I might put forward the idea that bad boys and nice guys may have different traits. You know, that, and if, even if there were a preference for bad boys, it's not the preference for badness per se, and they might be desired just in spite of those traits. But in fact, generosity might be able to make anybody more desirable, all else being equal. And we can test this in the lab by creating, say for example, a simulated dating ad. So we have some you know, fine, handsome young man here uh, seeking dates. Um, and then we take this exact same guy and just add some small mention of generosity. In my spare time, I like stuff. I also volunteer at the food bank and at the group home. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, what a nice guy. And we compare people's reactions to this guy with that guy, all else being equal. And what we find is that this one, the altruistic one, is desired much more than the neutral version. The generosity increases the desirability, in particular for long-term relationships. And some follow-up work we have uh, where we look at people's 
actual mating success, and we see that people who are more altruistic are more successful in romance. For example, perhaps having higher number of lifetime sexual partners and so on, suggesting that there may be tangible benefits to being nice. And this maps on to some research from hunter-gatherer societies, where the good hunters who share the meat that they have caught with their entire group tend to have more offspring because they are able to attract better wives, but also they are more able to have more affairs with the wives of other guys. So this is not just our culture. So when we ask the question, does it pay to be generous? Do ni when do nice guys finish first? We need to ask, well, is anyone watching? Because when that reputation is present, that allows the nice guys to receive benefits from their actions. There's also a lot of work showing that because of this, people are much nicer when somebody else is watching. So this has been shown in a number of domains. People give more money in experimental games when uh, somebody else is watching. People are more willing to volunteer if their actions will be known. They comply with their taxes more often. They turn out to vote. They conserve more energy. They donate blood uh, at, at higher rates. Basically, any domain where it's been tested, people have shown that everybody's nicer when others are watching. And this is perhaps not all that surprising. I should note that this doesn't need to be a conscious, strategic, Machiavellian strategy because it's been suggested that even the presence of a picture of eyes, which trigger kind of an unconscious you know, sense of observation, might be enough to make people more generous, to donate more money to others, um, you know, or to conserve resources uh, more often. Now, there's some controversy over this, uh, this finding that, that we're uh, currently sorting out. You know, how long does it last? How generalizable is it? But however that pans out, we at least know that researchers accept the idea that much of this can be going on without our knowledge, and people might be uh, helping others without explicitly being concerned for their reputation. We also know that we can get people to compete to be more generous than others. So here we have uh, another experimental game where people uh, can first give to some sort of charity and then look at how much money um, you know, they, they're giving to charity. Well, so when nobody is observing their donations, sometimes they give something, but they give more when there is an observer who sees their donation. But they give the most when not only can that observer see, but can choose whom to interact with such that the two donors are essentially competing amongst each other to give more in order to be chosen. Competitive altruism, uh, if you will. Um, these little lines just represent 95 conference intervals for those who are interested in these statistics. Uh, some researchers in the United Kingdom have shown that in particular, men are more susceptible to show competitive altruism and be more likely to compete to donate money to attractive female fundraisers. So if the previous donor is a guy, then guys are more li likely to step up their game and give more money. Whereas they won't do that if the recipient is male, is an unattractive female, or if the other big donor was a woman. So they're, all, they're particularly stepping up their game and giving more in response to giving by other guys. Now, we can harness this, these powers. For example, creating opportunities for people to benefit from having a good reputation. Little stickers, I gave blood today, which allows the person to, to, to advertise their, uh, their acts. Stickers for uh, you know, promoting sustainable energy that, uh, that one can put on one door if one, uh, if one pays extra for sustainable energy. In order to increase types of cooperation that we, that, that we like in, so in society. And when you see other people having these stickers, this also changes the norms so that everybody else around sees that everybody else is cooperating and then has to step up their game in order to maintain the, to maintain the position and still to be seen as good. So if we can take some punchlines from this. First of all is that good reputation can pay off. Nice guys can finish first when there are opportunities for them to benefit from having a good reputation. We see that people seek a good reputation, are nicer when they're observed, and we can use that 
Uh, this doesn't need to be conscious. But finally, we can harness these reputational forces in order to increase the types of behavior that we like, like blood donations, like conserving uh, resources, and to reduce behaviors that we don't like in order to create an overall net gain for society. And that is my idea worth spreading. Thank you.